Hi, thank you for joining us for our monthly core advocate webinar using Achieve the Core tools to tackle common ELA issues. We're going to wait just a couple minutes for people to get logged in. In the meantime, um, we do have a poll about how many webinars you have attended, and we also have handouts available in your control panel. I'm on. Hello? Hi, we're just waiting a few minutes for participants to join us. Um, so just a few moments. Also, we are live broadcasting. Okay, great. So while we do have uh, just under half who have attended the webinar before, um, this is over half of the current audience's first time joining Crafty's webinar. We welcome you. We uh, hope that you get a lot out of this webinar. So your host for tonight will be myself, Janelle Sand. Linda Nguyen, Sandra Alberti, Joni Funderburg, and Jenny Beltramini uh, will all be on. We are the Sub Impact team. We have three guests this month. We have Lisa Goldschmidt, Director of the Digital Team, Leandra Taylor, Tennessee Core Advocate, and Najla Staggers, Connecticut Core Advocate. So we want to tell you more about who Core Advocates are and a little bit about the network. Core Advocates are teachers from all over the country who believe in the potential of high quality standards and the importance of all students being prepared for college and career. They support their colleagues in understanding and advocating for the standards and embrace the shift in instruction. And our Core Advocate Network now is over 12,000 educators strong, and we'd love for you to join us if you haven't already. So if you want to learn more about the network, um, feel free to contact my colleagues Jenny and Joni here. Their emails are also provided. Um, if you would like to join, you can go ahead and click on the URL here, achievethecore.org slash CA dash sign up to join the network. Um, or if you just want to learn more about the network and other opportunities, feel free to just go ahead and click on the achievethecore.org link um, and you can get started. Tweet with us. We are avid tweeters. We are active on social media and we encourage you to tweet uh, at Achieve the Core, at Joni Fund, at F. Alberti, at jo Jenny Beldro, and at Gravity Girl 1111 with the hashtag Core Advocate. We'll ask you to engage with us throughout the webinar. On your control panel, located usually on the right side of your screen, you can access handouts, which I hope we've already done. You can answer questions, typing in your answers as we ask them, and we'll also be engaging with you through polls as you've seen earlier. 
after the webinar, we will ask you to complete a short survey about the webinar to help us improve and tell us how you feel about the content. Uh, you will receive access to the recorded webinar, handout, and PowerPoint presentation about 24 to 48 hours after the end of the webinar. So we have three main goals for our webinar tonight. They are to understand how to find what you need on AchieveTheCore.org, explore Achieve the Core resources to use um, in building knowledge, share with your groups, um, or use them in your own classroom. And lastly, to hear from educators who use the tools and resources to improve their ELA and literacy instruction. So to get us started, we have a poll. How frequently do you use AchieveTheCore.org? Please take a moment to enter this poll. Okay, great. So uh, it looks like the majority of people interact with AchieveTheCore.org uh, at least once a week, with about once a month coming in a close second. Uh, so now we're going to get started with uh, Lisa Goldschmidt. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm excited about talking through this topic together tonight. And I was really glad to see that there are a lot of people on the webinar who are familiar with Achieve the Core. I think hopefully you'll get to know a little bit more about the resources that are there and maybe ways to use them that you haven't thought about previously. And for those of you who are new, welcome. And um, I hope through the course of the webinar you get more familiar and comfortable with what is available on the site. So, Let's start at the beginning. Achieve the Core, when you go to the home page, has three primary ways to get into the content. And I'm going to walk you through those three ways at, uh, to kick us off. And then I'll dive into some of the problems and the way our ELA resources can help you to solve them. Uh, during the webinar, I'd encourage you to stay on the webinar um, and listen and watch and follow along here. And then afterwards, we hope you will go and explore the site on your own. You'll notice on the homepage of Achieve the Core, there are three main pathways in, uh, professional learning, planning and reflection, and classroom resources. And these three pathways correspond really well with the three goals that Linda mentioned for the webinar. Um, resources that are designed to build knowledge, resources that should help you share with others, and resources that you can use in your classroom. So first, starting with professional learning, you'll see there are two categories of materials. On the left-hand side are insights, and this is a lot of the context information, foundational information about the shifts and college and career ready standards. These resources are really, really uh, tightly tied to this idea of building knowledge and to give you a foundation for all of the other resources that are going to be available throughout the site. On the collaboration side, we have our professional development modules, our survey, our knowledge and practice survey, which we encourage the use of in professional learning communities to facilitate conversations about college and career ready standards, and the aligned materials blog, which I will go into in quite a bit more detail later on in the presentation. In the planning and reflection section, these resources are lined up largely with the idea of sharing with others. So on the instructional practice side, we have our coaching tool and our lesson planning, planning tool and the instructional practice toolkit and classroom videos. 
these resources are all about thinking about college and career ready standards and instructional practice, how to see them in instruction, how to plan for them in your lessons. On the right hand side is instructional content. The top three resources listed here, uh, if you're not familiar with the site or you're new to uh, Student Achievement Partners resources, these are some of our most frequently sought resources. Um, the first two, text complexity and text dependent questions, correspond really tightly with the ELA shifts. The math focus by grade level documents are obviously aligned to the shift of focus. Um, and our quick way to see which standards align most closely to the major work of the grade, the additional and supporting standards. And finally below are alignment rubrics and our textbook adaptations. And these include some of the rubrics um, like the instructional materials evaluation tool or the assessment evaluation tool that help you to identify alignment in instructional materials and in assessments. But there are also these textbook adaptations, which is a set of resources that line up with specific commonly used textbooks that show how to take something that is uh, largely aligned and bring it into alignment by adjusting either um, the resource by adding to it, removing, um, or in other ways in uh, implementing it in ways that line up more closely to the shifts. And finally, the classroom resources section. These uh, will feel the most familiar in terms of resources. Uh, they're the grab and go, the tools that you would use in your classroom. They include lessons and tasks and mini assessments. What I want to make sure you see here are under the ELA category, the Academic Word Finder is in fact a digital tool that we'll talk about later on in the presentation. And then same on the math side, the last, uh, the last reference to the coherence map, that is also a digital tool. Uh, it's one of our most popular resources. And if you are also in looking for math resources, I would highly recommend that you check that out to see the way the standards relate to each other in a dynamic way. Few other things to point out before we go into the way the resources can help you solve problems in the ELA classroom. Uh, on each page of the site, you'll see the opportunity to share the resource, which you can do right from the page or favorite it. When you favorite resources, they are saved into your account, so you can always come back to them and view them again later which leads us to the idea of creating an account. Uh, if you have not yet created an account, we'd encourage you to do so. All you have to do is go to the home page and click on uh, sign in or log in uh, right at the top right corner. We protect your information. We are not uh, interested in providing it to anyone else. The reason to create an account is for you. So you can save all the resources that you wanna revisit in the future um, and also, so that you can customize your preferences. When you log in and you've made selections such as your uh, subject area of interest, the content on the home page will adjust based on the preferences you indicate. So uh, we'd encourage you to do that. If you signed up to be a core advocate prior to this webinar, then you have already signed up for an account on Achieve the Core. So as we were preparing for today's session, we kind of took stock of some of the biggest issues that come or the most frequent issues that come to us from our inbox and from core advocates and other educators that we work with. And they fall into these buckets generally. Um, designing text-dependent questions is a big one. Teachers often recognize text-dependent questions, but they're not always positive how to create the most uh, effective questions to get kids to what's most important about the text. Um, building knowledge through reading, we get a lot of questions about how to use independent reading to build knowledge and how to group text together to help build knowledge and vocabulary. Identifying and scaffolding complex texts, um, we probably get the most questions in this area generally. How do you identify complex text and how can you make sure all your students are able to access it? Working with imperfect materials covers a lot of ground. Uh, people often have questions about how to take materials that they have um, and bring them into alignment with college and career ready standards, and that takes a lot of shape. Uh, and finally, integrating the standards into PLC discussions. We often find that people have been having a conversation about college and career ready standards for a few years, and they don't always know how to identify 
gaps in their practice and how to bring those back to their PLCs to continue to build on their own uh, development and professional learning. Okay, so we have a question. What challenges do you experience as an ELA literacy teacher? Please use your question box to input your answer. Great, thank you for entering uh, challenges that you face into the question box. While you can't all see what everybody else is entering, I will reply to some of the responses and then you'll be able to see them all. But some of the patterns that I've seen, um, many people entering information or ideas about lesson planning, challenges with planning effective lessons, especially related to meeting the needs of diverse students. Um, a couple people mentioned vocabulary and, and vocabulary instruction, um, and some people are talking kind of related to the meeting the needs of, of different students or, or a variety of students in your classroom, uh, scaffolding or differentiating um, to meet a variety of needs. So we will, um, like I said, I'll share out some of these as the webinar progresses so that you can see what others are saying. Um, but thank you for taking time to answer the question and we will go ahead and go back to Lisa now. Thanks, Jenny. Well, I'm really glad to say that a lot of those topics that came up in the question box are ones that we will talk through as we dive into the problem of the evening, identifying and scaffolding complex text. If you did um, ask a, pose a challenge that we don't get to today, I do wanna uh, remind you that there's a handout provided as part of this webinar that has resource recommendations for the different problems that I referenced earlier. And if you don't see what you need on that handout, you're always welcome to reach out to us to ask about other resources um, that might help solve issues that you're facing. But to dive into the issue we're talking about today, I wanted to start by setting the scene a little. As we go through the content on the site, we'll talk through it in the categories that I mentioned earlier. This idea of resources that help build knowledge, resources to help facilitate sharing with groups, and resources you can use in your classroom. But something that often makes uh, those connections feel more tangible is to create a scenario. And so I picked one, one uh, that is something that came up pretty recently uh, in terms of the situation uh, someone was trying to, to help solve. So in this particular scenario, let's say uh, I'm working in a K-5 to school. I'm a literacy specialist. I work with the teachers in grades three to five. There are about four in each grade. And my school, has been focusing on complex text for a number of years now, but we haven't really talked about complex text since we started to implement text, these complex texts more regularly. And what's happened is because we don't really talk about it as much together, um, teachers have been off on their own trying to work through how to scaffold those texts for students. And in order to keep pace with the curriculum, uh, teachers are starting to separate out kids who are struggling readers or kids who are English language learners and give them materials that are not the complex text that their on grade level readers are reading. And so it's become a priority for us to try to figure out how to support teachers and help make sure that all kids are in fact being given access to the same complex text. One thing that I wanted to say here is the setting matters as does 
um, the time that I have and the group that I'm working with. So in this scenario, I do one-on-one -on -one discussion with all these teachers and we meet together for about 45 minutes every other week, give or take. So that's time that we can use together to focus on these issues, but it's not continuous time. And it, I wanna be realistic about what we can do together as a group and what we have to do on our own or what I can give to teachers when I'm working with them one-on-one. -on -one. So all of that is just to set you up for uh, the resources on Achieve the Four that can help me as a literacy specialist in this scenario. So first things first, building knowledge. Uh, I would wanna start by building my own knowledge. <laughs> so we have uh, resources, um, Achieve the Core that you are participating in at the moment are webinars. Um, these are terrific tools for building knowledge. They are all specific and narrow to a topic. They're about 40 to 50 minutes of content each. They dive into some background on some specific area and then also pull in the experience of practitioners. You can listen to the recording, you can use the materials, you can adapt them, you can share them. So in this case, there are two webinars that have taken place in the last two years that I would refer back to as the, the ELA specialist in this school to help initially build my own knowledge on the topic again. The first one is what is text complexity and why does it matter? In this uh, webinar, we go through a little bit of a refresher on what makes text complex and also why that text complexity matters when you're creating lessons. So the webinar really talks about helping kids to find their own way to the heart of what's in a complex text and not sort of robbing them of those opportunities for discovery. And so it's a, it's a very easy, tangible, and um, familiar way to think about why this work really matters. The other webinar I would take some time to look at is supporting all learners in accessing complex text. It builds off of the content of the other webinar, but it goes into more specific tips for scaffolding complex text for students who may not be reading on grade level or may, may just need additional support. I can use these resources, as I said, for myself, just to refresh my own knowledge, or I may want to share parts of them with the group that I work with um, if I think that it'll be motivating for them or if I think it's easier for them to get the content by listening to a few minutes of a recap versus giving them something to read. It all depends on the kinds of time that they have. What I probably wouldn't do, given that we have limited time together as a group, is sit and watch the webinar together. Another way uh, to build knowledge on the site is through our research and articles. Again, as the literacy special, specialist in this scenario, um, I would go to the two tools that are listed here. One of them goes in, is an annotated bibliography on the first shift, and the other is uh, an annotated bibliography on the role of close reading. And both of these give me a few key points from a number of different research studies about why complex text is so critical and ways to implement close reading in my school. Um, that would be useful for me to go into conversations that I would then want to lead in my PLC and have one-on-one -on -one with the teachers that I'm working with. In some cases, that research may also support um, teachers' understanding. It may be interesting to them. It may be motivating to them to see the background themselves, and I could take snippets or go to the articles, find things that I think would be compelling to the group that I work with. Or I may say, diving into the research is not um, something that's feasible given everything everyone has on their plate. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pull what I need and be ready for the next set of conversations. And finally, under this building knowledge category, we have the articles on Aligned. So the Align blog, as I mentioned earlier, is a forum for discussion on a lot of issues around instructional materials alignment and how to bring that alignment into the classroom. It represents a lot of different voices, teachers, practitioners, uh, folks working in the field in different capacities, experts, all around a variety of issues that um, 
are really common and that people tend to struggle with. And so you'll see the Align blog has a few very relevant articles to the topic that we've raised this evening. Um, supporting all learners with complex text and the top five questions about ELA scaffolding for high school and elementary school. In the scenario that I've presented, I would likely pull probably the first article and maybe the last for the group that I work with. We, the most frequent use of the articles that's reported back to us is people like to use them as pre-reading before PLCs or professional development. Each blog post is about 500 words. Um, they're focused, they're interesting, they often include uh, links to additional resources, pictures, they're very, um, they're very tangible, they're very heartfelt often, and uh, we really recommend them as a way to just dip a toe into a topic um, that you want to dive into more as a group. Great. Uh, and now we <clears throat> have a poll. What do you most often, what do you use most often to build your knowledge when you have questions about CCR? Andrew. We'll just give everyone a moment to answer that poll. Great, thank you for taking our poll. It looks like most people on the webinar tonight uh, use Google or other websites as their go-to resources for building knowledge or answering questions they might have around college and career ready standards. But 28% of you uh, usually go to achieve the core and less people use print materials or colleagues or other. That's Great. And I think very representative of how um, there is a lot of diversity in the way people seek out information. And so it is always important to remember that when thinking about how to use the resources. Something we often say is, I will introduce the resources this evening based on a perception of how they can be used, but there's no wrong way to use them. Um, if I share something that I say it's for sharing with groups, and you think it would be terrific for building your own knowledge, we support you wholeheartedly in doing that. Um, but moving into this next section, this idea of sharing with groups. Um, building knowledge is obviously incredibly important, but a lot of times uh, sharing with others, having opportunities for discussion, having opportunities to practice is really important when you're trying to change your practice, implement something new, integrate new content into your curriculum. And so one of the tools that we would recommend uh, for sharing with groups around this issue of scaffolding complex text is the Instructional Practice Guide. Now, the Instructional Practice Guide, for those who are not familiar, uses low inference observation and evidence gathering to help focus an observation on not only what's being taught, but how it's being taught. Um, and so Core Action 1 in particular in this piece focuses on whether a text is at the center of a lesson and whether that text is of uh, quality and complexity for the students who you're teaching. Core actions two and three then go into what kinds of questions and scaffolds are in place and how students are demonstrating perseverance and understanding. And so using this tool, you can work together to understand what's happening and give each other feedback and also get on the same page about what you're seeing in the classroom, yours or a classroom that you would observe together like a video. 
So one of the activities that I'd recommend for sharing with groups in the realm of understanding complex sex is the Instructional Practice Guide uh, Professional Development Module. Core Action 1 in that module in particular focuses on analyzing a text. And for the scenario that I presented earlier, uh, where this group of teachers hasn't really come back together on the topic of what makes the text complex and therefore what does that mean for instruction and scaffolding, having an activity where you actually go through the process of um, analyzing the text for its quantitative and qualitative features could be very, very grounding. Um, it's a great way to kick off the discussion, refresh knowledge, and ensure that everyone is on the same page. This might be an activity that I would say was worth the 45 minutes of time we have together because it can open up the conversation again about not only what makes the text complex, but specifically what are the challenges that the group is having. And then if you'll remember, I, I showed earlier the aligned post about supporting all learners with complex texts. If I had sent this around to the group earlier, then I may uh, open up a conversation about what in the blog post resonated and what things we might try as a group to help solve um, the issue of scaffolding for students who are not able to access the text in the way that we've been uh, introducing them to the class. So finally, with each of these activities, um, practice really helps. So you could, as a group, decide to go into classrooms with the instructional practice guide, observe each other, talk about scaffolds that came from the aligned blog post. In some cases, that would be great. And in some cases, the time may not be available to do peer-to-peer -peer observation, or there may not be comfort yet in uh, figuring out what it is we're going to try or what it looks like when we try it. And so one of the resources that's available on Achieve the Core that might support this sharing with groups and practicing together is additional videos. Um, you can use these videos on your own between your 45 minute meetings uh, or together in a group as one of the 45 minute sessions where you do the observations together and then talk through what you see, what scaffolds are in place, what could have uh, benefited in the lesson to help make sure all kids were accessing the the content of the lesson. Great, and now we have another poll. Who do you share resources and ideas with most often? We'll give everyone a few moments. Great, thank you for sharing. It looks like most of you, um, almost half responded that you most often share ideas and resources with your grade level team or content area teams. I did notice a few people selected other. Um, some of you are ELA coaches or literacy coaches or maybe an ELA coordinator, and so you work with multiple teachers across the school or many teachers across the district. Um, some of you even mentioned sharing uh, with outside um, people who are external to your school as well. So thank you for responding, and we are going to pass uh, the microphone back to Lisa again. Thank you. So you've built your knowledge, you've shared with others, now it's time to try it. Or the other way around, sometimes you want to try it in your classroom first and then come back together as a group. Well, one of the resources that we have on Achieve the Core to support this use of complex text and scaffolding of complex text is our close reading model lessons. Um, we recommend them because they have great appropriate complex text that's been selected. It, they have um, text dependent questions, they have academic vocabulary. And so you can use them and know that the materials of high quality and you can focus in on the instruction and really think about how to scaffold for your students who may need additional support 
to get to what's really critical about the texts that are included. Um, one of the ways in which this PLC group may work together is perhaps the teachers in different grades can choose one of the lessons to use. All of them can use the same lesson and they can come back together and discuss which scaffolds worked, what didn't work, what they were able to readily introduce and, and what they had difficulty introducing. Also, if they're all using the same lesson, they can use the instructional practice guide to observe each other and go in with the knowledge of what the lesson is and what the text is, which may make the discussion around the instructional practice pieces easier. All of the uh, resources that uh, talk about how to help scaffold for students who are having difficulty accessing text will reference as one of the possible issues, vocabulary. And so a way in which the group may work together to implement the lesson more effectively is to use the academic word finder to pull out more of those tier two words and create student facing glossaries with um, the words used in context for the kids in the class, particularly those kids who are struggling with the, the tier two vocabulary in the text. All of the students will receive vocabulary instruction on what's specific to the text, but some of those kids who are not capturing as much of the meaning may need more practice with the tier two vocab. And so this is a tool to just help um, pull more of those words out and a resource that you can print out and give to kids um, alongside the lesson that's already been created. Another resource that you can use in your classroom for similar reasons are the mini assessments. These have um, great appropriate complex text that have already been selected. They have uh, questions that are text dependent, that are rich and will push to see whether students really understand what's at the heart of the text that they're reading. Um, and many of our close reading model lessons actually are paired with mini assessments. So when you go on to achieve the core to find a close reading model lesson to use, if you know that you'd like to also give students an opportunity to practice um, with formative assessment, you can pull one that has that attached to it as well. So there's an example of that just on the next slide. And so this may give, uh, in a situation like this, the group of teachers that are working together an opportunity to talk about not only the implementation of the lesson and making sure that the all students are getting access to the complex text, it may give them a way to see whether that instruction has resulted in all students um, being able to independently respond to questions about the text. And now we have a question. Um, how could one or more of these tools mentioned here help you in your setting? Please use the question box in your control panel. And we'll give everyone just a few seconds to type in a question or type an answer. Great, thank you for sharing in the question tab. And if you didn't get a chance to write in how you might use one or more of those tools in your setting, feel free to keep um, typing that in. We, I saw one person say that um, everything that was mentioned would be helpful in their setting. Um, but I've seen lots of uh, references to the academic word finder and how that might be useful for teaching or for working with teachers. I saw a couple people mention the instructional practice guide. Um, one person said they're already using it with teachers and and and, and need to continue and, and keep working on that. Um, several people mentioned complex text 
um, with scaffolds and, and how they want to read more about that and find out more about that. Um, so thank you for sharing. I will reply to some of these and share them out so that you can all see some of the responses. Thanks, Jenny. So to help us talk more about what this looks like uh, in different settings, we are going to introduce the first of our guest core advocates. We have Leandria Taylor, District Instructional Facilitator, Memphis, Tennessee. Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody out there in webinar land, I'm so excited to be here tonight to share with you um, how we've been using the Achieve the Core website in Shelby County Schools um, to help our district with some of the opportunities we currently have to improve teaching and learning outcomes here in our district. Just a little bit about um, Shelby County Schools. Uh, we're the largest school district in the state of Tennessee and one of the largest districts in the country. Um, and many of the schools here in uh, Shelby County are considered underperforming. So I currently work as a district instructional facilitator. Um, so I work with those schools at the bottom 5% of Shelby County schools in what's called the turnaround model. And my role is simply to support schools so that they move out of the bottom 5%. I work closely with school leaders and teachers uh, to look closely at a school's instructional programming and to help them think through problems of practice. Much of my work is done side by side with building leaders and teachers um, in the hopes that we really turn around things and improve uh, student achievement across this district. It changed the slide. All right, so. To provide some contact text, this year our district adopted a new curriculum. Uh, we adopted the EL curriculum or expeditionary learning uh, in order to support our teachers with making the instructional shifts they needed to make in order to help students reach grade level goals and eventually the college and career ready goals. Uh, and EL provided us with standards aligned resources um, that would be uh, sufficiently complex already designed to help build student knowledge around topics. So this program really took away some of the issues that teachers face, like having to search for complex texts or trying to find connected texts that would build student knowledge, which we all know is really, really time consuming. So thankfully, um, EL took some of those issues away and uh, it really allowed us to give our teachers back that time uh, where they, they use to search and gather resources really to hone in and focus on instruction in their classrooms and student learning. Uh, and the, the program is um, very heavily scripted. So we spend a lot of time helping teachers understand the importance of planning and how to appropriately plan uh, in order to differentiate for the students that were sitting in front of them. We really had to, you know, stop and help teachers understand how to scaffold the learning for students and uh, understand some of the limitations of the program. And we learned that no program is a silver bullet um, and that with customization, customization and planning, uh, we could ensure that the students in our district will receive uh, what they needed from instruction. Can you change the slide? One of the ways we supported teachers in our district is by using the IPG. Uh, we conduct informal observations with teachers, with building administrators, um, and this guide has really been helpful um, with us uh, as we work with teachers and leaders because it gives us a common understanding of what standards aligned instruction looks like, first of all. And then it also gave us a common language to use when we were discussing discussing effective teaching. Um, so as we began to use the instructional practice guide or the IPG as I'll be calling it, um, some data started to kind of come to the forefront um, and it unearthed a problem of practice for us. Uh, the IPG data suggested that our students really needed targeted to support to develop vocabulary in order for them to make meaning from text. We knew that we were dealing with students in an urban setting and that traditionally they come to us with vocabulary deficits. Um, and yet uh, the EL does provide some of the vocabulary words, but we really needed for teachers to understand, well, what are the vocabulary words that the students in your class need? 
Um, and so using the IPG, we intuitively knew from looking at core action one that we would have to focus on vocabulary. Um, the level of complexity of the text was changing that we were putting in front of students. And this uh, more complex text signaled to us, hey, we've got to focus on vocabulary. More complex text equal more vo complex vocabulary. Um, and so we knew this was going to be a barrier for our students because they already struggled with vocabulary, um, even before the level of the text complexity changed. Um, and so one of our struggles is with reading comprehension. Um, and in all of the research that you'll read shows that there is a direct correlation between gaps in student vocabulary and their ability to comprehend text. Um, so we knew that our teachers needed uh, to lean into vocabulary instruction um, and that vocabulary needed to come from the text uh, and we needed to figure out how to help teachers understand which of those words were most important and which one of those words uh, in the text needed to be taught explicitly or implicitly. Core Action 2C of the, core, um, of the IPG also helped us focus in on the types of questions that teachers were asking. Uh, we understood that if students had a vocabulary deficit, that some of the questions, many of the questions that teachers were asking in the class should be around the academic vocabulary in the text. And what we found from the IPG walkthrough data is that not enough questions in the classroom were devoted to asking questions about the vocabulary. Um, and with the deficit uh, that we faced, we knew that we needed to help teachers identify which words they needed to teach and also to help them to develop text-dependent questions around the, the um, academic vocabulary. Next slide. So after we, you know, disaggregated our IPG data and kind of had some conversations, um, our next hurdle was, well, then how do we help teachers to understand which words to choose? So we developed some professional development with teachers around uh, tier two vocabulary words, but we still found that teachers struggled a little bit uh, with identifying those tier two words. Um, and so this academic word finder um, that you could find on the Achieve the Core website really helped us to support teachers with choosing the right words to focus on for their students. Uh, in order to help teachers, uh, we're going to we're planning to train them on using the academic on using the vocabulary word finder and supporting them um, with the development of text dependent questions based on the words um, that, that that are critical for uh, vocabulary instruction. And this tool is super easy to use. Uh, that's what I really liked about it. Teachers just copy and paste segments of the text that they're teaching directly um, into the word finder, press submit, and then the tool identifies the academic vocabulary for the selected grade. It also um, looks at the words as they fall into a grade level either below or above. Uh, those teachers are provided with student-friendly definitions, the parts of speech, sample sentences, sentences. So this tool is really helpful with helping teachers identify, you know, the words that they need to focus on with their students. Um, and so what we plan to do is help teachers with strategies for teaching vocabulary, uh, giving them activities with vocabulary. We're really going to beef up vocabulary instruction across um, our district. We are also um, having teachers to read one of the articles uh, written by David Liebman called Vocabulary and the Common Core. Um, and I think this is going to help frame our conversation, help us uh, to develop some common understandings and common language as we talk about vocabulary instruction, which is critical to the success of students in Shelby County Schools. Um, and we're hoping to see some improved student reading outcomes from this focus on the academic vocabulary uh, that's found in the text. And thank you so much for tuning in tonight, and I enjoy talking to you. Thank you. That was amazing. Uh, okay, and now we have our next graduate guest, Nasha Staggers, literacy education specialist from the Greater Hartford region, Connecticut. Welcome. Good evening. How is everyone out there? Um, so a problem of practice that I tend to face often 
um, in the Greater Harper Region um, is around the area of independent reading. Um, I service um, school districts within the Greater Harper Region in Connecticut, which is over 35 school districts and beyond. Um, and so most of the school districts that I service um, are implementing a reading and writing workshop. And so teachers are engaged in independent reading and independent writing. So students tend to spend an average of 30 to 40 minutes in independent reading, which is self-selecting text on their own. Teachers have classroom libraries from which students choose texts that are on their level. In order to support teachers' understanding of text complexity in a balanced literacy framework, where part of the literacy is spent in level text, teachers must understand they must move students up levels and ensure students are engaged in reading text both at and beyond their reading level. So that much of the time teachers are spending working with students reading within a band of text complexity or beyond that band. Next slide. To support a community of practice on reading within bands of text complexity, a tool that is helpful on the SAP um, site for ELA is the text complexity qualitative measures rubric, which you see on your screen. And they have both the literature and information text. This opens the conversation up to more, to more than Lexile numbers or Fontes and Pinnell level lettering system, but rather gives them an idea of what can make a text complex for readers or what makes the text challenging. So when we're looking at this tool, We'll go through the text structure, the language features, meaning and knowledge demands against the rating system, the rubric. We may pull a grade level text when I'm working with teachers and they have either a read aloud or a student um, independent reading text and we try to tackle it by guesstimating the challenges that students will face when they encounter the text by using the rubric. And this does a couple of things when I'm working with teachers. Teachers become familiar with the qualitative measures of the text. They begin to notice that a text can have a range, so texts are not one size fits all. It helps them understand the necessity to get students to read within bands and not just at their level. For example, if you have students reading at a Fontes and Pinnell guided reading level or during a small group, a level M, I can encourage the teachers to have students reading within the bands so that they wouldn't just be reading level M, but instead they might be reading within the bands M and O or beyond that level which is very important for text complexity. The tool also shows teachers that within the band, there may be small differences between reading levels, and we use the tool to begin talking about what those differences are. For example, what's the difference between a Fontes and Pinnell reading level M versus an N versus an O, which is really important um, for teachers to notate so that they can plan their instruction accordingly. Next slide. So how does this change practice? Um, well, one way that we see that this changes practice is that teachers begin to recognize that students need access to complex text and that uh, levels are just that. Levels are for books and not they're not for students. So uh, during shared reading or read aloud or independent reading, we really are stressing for teachers to utilize more complex text, but also to encourage to children to be able to go beyond levels and that levels can be very fluid. The leveling system is very fluid. Students can move across levels and in and out of bands, depending on the, the topic that they're reading on and the language features that they have. Teachers use the qualitative measures to determine how they'll confer one-on-one -on -one with students or in small groups with students during independent reading. And this really helps teachers because it discourages them from leaving kids at a particular level, which is very important, so that kids are not staying at an MNO in that band, but they're moving across bands and in and out of bands. And teachers have to use best practices to determine the needs of readers encountering the text, which is really, really important um, for students, especially when, they're, when they are utilizing independent reading uh, structure in their classroom. Next slide. What's visual that we can actually see the visible change in classrooms that you can see uh, that students are no longer worried about their reading level because they know that they have this openness to the classroom library that has begun. So they're not having to worry and ask, is this a level M, is this a level N or O? They're able to read with, within and with, inside levels and without of being in level. 
They can be across levels. Um, classroom libraries are less leveled, and they're more like Barnes and Noble. They can go to the shelves and select books that are appropriate and beyond what they would actually normally read because they have strategies now. And they're using the tools to determine how to plan instruction. And then finally, um, using this tool, what we're finding is that teachers are getting to know their readers better because they're understanding the text better as well and the structures of the text and how they go. Thank you That's so it. much. Thank you so much to both of our presenters. Uh, we now have a few moments to take questions. If you have a question, please type it into the question box, as you may have done earlier, and we look forward to seeing them. We'll just give everyone a moment or two. Hey, thank you. I have one question. I think that um, maybe Lisa could um, answer for us. And as she's answering, feel free to continue typing your questions for any of our guests in the question box. Um, so Lisa, is the qualitative rubric on Achieve the Core for daily independent reading and guided reading? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I love that question. First and foremost, the rubric itself is on Achieve the Core, um, both of them. Uh, and we typically think of the qualitative rubrics as being for identifying the, the features that are most critical for instruction for complex texts for everyday reading. For independent reading, we uh, don't typically use the qualitative rubrics. We think about the groupings of texts that will help kids to build knowledge and vocabulary first and foremost. So we have resources like the Book Basket Professional Development. There are a number of articles on the lines about Book Basket, um, the text set that helped to think about how to group text for independent reading that will help kids to just build up that knowledge that will help them scaffold towards understanding a complex text. Great, thank you. Um, and we will, just so you all know, we will be emailing out this PowerPoint presentation and all of the materials from the webinar tonight. And so we can include as well a link to the resources around book baskets in the, in the um, PowerPoint when we send it as well. Um, so I had a question, I think it was for Leandra, um, around uh, you talked about needing to build vocabulary and um, having that as being something that was a, uh, a need in your school and somebody's wondering around how do you use that academic word finder to also meet the needs of English language learners or other students who struggle? Hi, that's a great question. Um, so I once was listening to David Lieben and I recall him saying how, what's academic vocabulary for one student, what's your, Two for one student may be a tier one word for another student. And so we know that when we're dealing with L's, some of the words that are common in the English language for them are, <clears throat> are tier two words and they need explicit instruction in those. One of the ways that we have used uh, the academic word binder with L's is to share that information with our uh, EL teacher, ELL teachers. Um, and so we, sh we share that information. We have those teachers look over those lists and to kind of help us kind of navigate what their students need and help us to differentiate instruction for those students. So that's one way that, that the academic um, word finder has been very helpful. So when we're meeting with teachers in PLCs um, and the English language learner teachers are in there, they are weighing in um, on those words and also they have those words uh, and take those back to their classroom too, so that they can provide support to those the students around uh, some of those words inside uh, of those in their uh, English language learner classrooms, if that makes sense. Thanks so much. Well, we love all your questions <laughs> and we hope that you continue to stay engaged with us. We are getting close to time, so uh, we are unfortunately going to have to wrap up the question portion, um, but thank you so much for asking them.
So we'd love for you to join our Core Advocate Network if you found this webinar helpful. We're committed to solving real problems that real teachers have, and we know the best way to do this is to get to know what you're experiencing in your own classroom. So um, we encourage you to join the network by filling out this survey completely at achievethecore.org slash ca dash sign up. Um, and we also want to know what instructional advocacy you're already doing. Um, so go ahead and fill out the instructional advocacy action form here at achievethecore.org slash educators dash taking action. Um, and we might even tap you to be our next webinar guest. Please join us again for next month's webinar, Math Modeling Myths. It will be Wednesday, uh, February 7th, 7 to 8, and you can find this registration link live once we share the PowerPoint with participants. Thank you again so much for joining us, and we hope to see you again next month.